Happening now on Grid Tonight, Liberty Media made a big purchase and statement. How powerful have they become with Formula One and now MotoGP under its ownership? Lola Cars is returning to motorsports to compete in Formula E. Will their partnership with Yamaha help them find success in electric racing? Supercar star Cam Waters is the latest driver from down under to give NASCAR a shot. Could he follow in Shane Van Gisbergen's footsteps and make his way to America full time in the future? Hello to all of you who's watching here in the United States and around the world. Welcome to Grid Tonight, your weekly motorsports news program. I'm Kobe Lambeth, and with me are Joshua Birch and Matt White from Grid Endurance Performance Index. We encourage everyone to comment in the chat, ask questions, and support us through Super Chat. Now, Josh, take it away with our top story this evening. And, and it was a story that I honestly thought was an April Fool's Day joke, so I had to really check before I believed it. <laughs> yes, uh, good evening, Kevin. Good evening, Matt. Good evening, everybody. A major news story that dropped on Monday. And as you say, it wasn't an April Fool's Day joke because Liberty Media has acquired 86% of Dorna Sports. Now, yes, Liberty Media, who own Formula One, is now the majority owner of Dorna, MotoGP, Moto2, Moto3, Moto E, Superbike World Championship, and the new Women's Circuit Racing World Championship as well. Now, since Liberty took over control of F1, we've seen it grow exponentially in the United States, especially after the popular Netflix series of Drive to Survive. MotoGP has made a similar deal with Amazon Prime to do their own version of Drive to Survive, but it only lasted a single season. Now, MotoGP introduced sprint races at every event last year as F1 added several sprints in the graphic there courtesy of Liberty Media. Yes, Matt, we had to sort of wake up a little bit, didn't we, to make sure it was all true. It was in the rumor works for a while, wasn't it, as well? Big ones there from Leonardo coming in there. We was in the rumor mill for a while, that this mm. was going to happen. We all heard the rumors. We all sort of dismissed it. The timing was weird to drop it. But how massive is it for Liberty Media to own the pinnacle of automobile club racing in both motorcycles and automobiles and with MotoGP and the other feeder series that come with it? Yeah. Uh, good evening, Josh. Good evening, Kobe. Hello, everybody. Um, back at normal European time tonight. So we're a little bit bleary eyed after a couple of weeks at better time for us. Uh, but we're back at the 11 o'clock hour. Um, and yeah, you're right. This news, you know, strange day for this to roll out was April Fool's Day. But here we are. And this is actually happening. Um, and, and what a mad story this is. Uh, Liberty Media coming in and sweeping MotoGP, who... As you say, the rumours have been circulating pretty much since the end of last season, certainly beginning of this year, post-Christmas, um, that there was an opportunity for Dorna to, or, or MotoGP and, and the Dorna group to have someone buy into them as such. And Liberty have come in and taken more than three quarters of the rug from under them, uh, if you if you like, with that 86% share. Dorna will still control what we see coming out of the TV set every week, really, the on-track product, but the ownership strand has gone to Liberty. Now, if you think back to pre-Formula One uh, Liberty days, like early early to mid-teens, Formula One was not in the place that it has been over the last couple of years. And to be fair to Liberty, and we've talked a lot about them in the last six months or so on this show, especially, on the downside, but they massively picked Formula One up, and this is exactly the kick in the bum that Motor GP especially needs because the their marketing strategy over the last couple of years, especially since Valentino Rossi retired, um, has been terrible. And I've been watching this paddock since 98, 99, I'd guess. Um, and the racing is brilliant. It is a tremendous product, but it's not getting enough eyes on it. And now they've got the Liberty Group behind them. And this falls into a couple of other things we've seen recently with, uh, especially in the US side, Liberty own uh, Discovery, the Discovery Group, with, which is TNT. And now we can see Merge EP on uh, that product in the US. It's all falling into place a little bit for them in that sense. But now they can hopefully really push this forward and get a lot more eyes on Merge EP because it deserves to be watched 
by everybody. It should be appointment viewing. Should we should have a race this weekend, but it got cancelled in Argentina. So interesting to see what we get when we get to Cota in a couple of weeks. What more quotes we'll get from the Dorna side because we haven't really heard much from them apart from the press releases that came out uh, at the beginning of the week when the announcement was raised. But my key thing here is that the promotion that MotoGP desperately needed over the last three or four years, maybe longer, finally it might get some push behind it and uh, that can start going in the right direction. Absolutely, because under Bernie Eccleston's rule of Formula One, uh, not everybody could watch the highlights of Grand Prix live on television. Nobody could do anything like this. It was all pay TV and locked behind doors and literally blood out of a stone. Let's just catch up on some comments first of all, though. Hi to Omi, who always watching on and makes a very good point as well, does Adam, that MotoGP is incredible. Thank you, Adam in the USA on True TV. It is. It is. It's just incredible as well. Omi brings up a good point that I want to link into in a second once we're finished with these comments. The good thing is we won't see any clashes as Liberty Media wouldn't want that. And I'll get on further that in just a second as we read to the comments because uh, Matt Owens or Matthew says, um, absolutely loving being able to watch on True TV. Phenomenal athletes as well. They really, really are. And it's been two great races. Yeah, the, the, the big thing here is for Liberty Media, they're not going to want to uh, have a clash between their two biggest rivals. So having Formula One and MotoGP now owned by the same company means the start times are now no longer going to clash. So if you remember back to the end of last year, where we had Formula One having its normal end of season in Abu Dhabi and everything was already decided, everything was wrapped up, nothing was left to fight for, that still got more viewers then the finale in Valencia, which had a massive title decided that was absolutely brilliant and ended up with Martin crashing out, Bang Nara getting the title. That was live on free to air television and TNT Sports and all around the world. It got thrashed in the ratings. And that is because the promotion is not good because they're on at exactly the same time. Formula One started, an hour later it was MotoGP. I had to run between two different commentary boxes to cover both. So that is no longer going to happen. I'm very thankful for that. No more clashes. Brilliant. Another thing is, this is great news for MotoGP because where Formula One, as you mentioned earlier, Matt, they were struggling behind in the early teens where there was no race highlights, there was nothing. MotoGP had a higher social media presence. It's gone backwards now since Liberty took over. Every week you get highlights of practice, highlights of the qualifying, race, sprint, sprint race highlights, race highlights, post-race shows live everywhere. With MotoGP, you're lucky if you if you even get a live grid uh, like 30 minutes before. There's nothing on their social media channels. Their social media is a joke. There's no highlights of any sprint or race action. There's no pre-race build-up, post-race build-up. There's nothing there. It's all locked away behind the video pass. And my channel is akin to that because MotoGP is my biggest viewer. During the test, we had over 60,000 people watching because and they were, that was just a timing screen with me throwing together stuff because that's all we had. With Liberty taking control, I think the social output is going to be massive because we are going to start getting those highlights and we're going to see a big digital change. So in a follow-up question, could Liberty help evaluate MotoGP and do you anticipate them making any big changes, not only to MotoGP in terms of the social and digital output, but also to the race weekends themselves with the format that the riders don't like? Yeah, and Omi, as to your point, Josh, with saying that they have the F2 yeah. and F3 highlights on the F1 YouTube page for certain. I agree. If you think, again, if you think back to pre-Liberty days in the that early teens, the dawn of Twitter and social media getting on board, where was Formula One? It was absolutely nowhere, dead, doornail, uh, nada, nothing coming out of uh, Formula One at all in terms of social media. And then they got the ball rolling. And then, you know, we've had, you know, during the pandemic, we had full races, classic races streamed on the YouTube channel. That, that would never have been thought about five years ago. MotoGP does a similar thing and Superbike too, to some degree on, on the World Superbike side. But yeah, hopefully that is going to, as I said before, really give them a, a shot in the arm interesting to, you picked up on the start times that isn't something i had not thought of so are we going to have are we even going to have clashes are we going to have motor gp then the next weekend formula one then the next weekend merch? is that going to be the way the calendar works something to be wary of where will world superbike fit into this as well because that's now under this uh big umbrella what will they do with it please don't 
please don't kill it off because that's something that you, you, they might just do. Oh, well, we've got this now, so let's shuffle that off over there because the races at Barcelona are uh, a couple of weeks ago were absolutely tremendous um for instance so world superbike is on a massive uptick at the moment um and hopefully they can jump onto the coattails of all of this too but yeah from a an output side of things it all looks very positive doesn't it for the points that we've both already raised there's already been a lot of twitter backlash i suppose you could say from people going oh no we're going to have street tracks for motor gp they're not going to go to all the classic circuits but that's also been said of formula one and you can possibly say true but they still go to spa they still go to monza just signed a new deal silverstone massive new deal signed a couple of weeks back monaco still on the calendar although it's coming up to deal time for monaco too suzuka new deal coming up this weekend of course they haven't got rid of the classic tracks if if liberty get rid of your assens and your Jerez uh, and Mugello, then we've got a problem on our hands and, and start taking it to, you know, far flung places that no one's heard of, <clears throat> Kazakhstan, um, Kimi Ring. Uh, so we'll see. But at the moment, it looks all pretty positive for MotoGP. And as I said, the crest of a wave through the early noughties and the Valentino Rossi and the wave behind all of that going on. And, uh, you know, being slightly with my fan biased hat on uh, during that Rossi Stoner uh, era, a little bit towards <laughs> the end of the 2000s, and then Marquez coming in, there was so much interest. But as That's soon great. as Rossi retired, everyone went with him. And maybe those people have gone to Formula One to some degree, uh, you know, to get their motorsport fix. But hopefully this can bring people back because there's so many people in the MotoGP paddock that if they had a spotlight shined on them, They'd be megastars, and they've got one coming. And we've seen it over the last couple of weeks oh, with Pedro Ocon. Exactly the right time for that young guy to have a big uh, push behind him because he's going to win multiple championships in the years to come. He is going to be a race winner this season on that um, Gas Gas sure. KTM, which is still the factory K Gas Gas as well. Uh, gas Gas running the same bike as KTM's factory team, but there's even talk already of Jack Miller and him swapping over as well. More on that later. Uh, get to the comments then, because we've got Adam saying World Superbikes are awesome, another good series. Interesting enough, though, we'll get we'll get back onto World Superbikes and what we mentioned in the next part of the comment, because there is mm. something still that Liberty have to do. Uh, so we'll get back onto that in a second. Uh, Leonardo says, also brings money GP to people like me who know nothing about it. Perfect. Yeah. That's exactly it. Got to bring you it out it. there. This is good for Momi. Possibly could MotoGP in its feeder series maybe come onto Sky or other channel that could be good unless price increases massively due to it. The TV deal is running out at the end of this year for TNT Sports, but I cannot see it leaving TNT Sports. That's a good home for it. The only good thing that could come from this, uh, Matthew, for both this UK and US point of view and the rest of the world, free-to-wear television. Because ITV have got it here in the UK, and it's been a bit bizarre because it was free in Portugal, but they put it on ITV3 and ITV4, which is, for those of you in America, is like putting it on C-SPAN. It's, it's way, way, way down the order. Nobody ever watches it. So Omi puts out that could also bring more people in as they haven't had to pay extra stuff like TNT. Like I may watch from time to time, but I want to pay extra. Could we see possibly like half the races live, half the races and highlights from a dedicated broadcaster? Potentially. Uh, yeah, they, we did have the uh, races at Portimao last week in the UK on free to air. They didn't promote it at all, ITV. It was just, just landed in their lap and they'll have Silverstone uh, obviously, because they have to have the the Grand Prix, a bit like the British Grand Prix for Formula One is on Channel Four mm. in the UK. Uh, ITV have got their link with TNT, but as I mentioned before, TNT and the Discovery Group part of Liberty, so not gonna move. it all lines up nicely, and that takes in the US um, stuff on True TV as well. So um, yeah, you're right. Then they've done a terrific job on the what was BT Sport and now TNT side with their coverage going, it's going really well. So I can't see that uh, changing. And of course, Eurosport becomes more TNT channels after the Olympics as well in the UK, which has world and British Superbikes. So 
you're all again from a UK parochial perspective, it all brings it back under the banner. Mm -hmm. I can't see MotoGP in the UK ending up on Sky Sports F1. I just in I don't just yeah, I can't see that being a thing. Yeah, yeah. that would be like <laughs> to, to your point, just that'd be like MotoGP ending up on Fox Sports Two from yeah. a couple of years ago when that was a thing. Uh, so. Yeah. <laughs> Another good thing about this as well is that now we very much do have a split, don't we? Which I think is quite good because everyone moans now about where to watch all the racing. Apart from Formula E, which might do a little bit of moving around to Sky Sports eventually, I'm hearing. Uh, that's another thing that's in the works. We've got, if you want four wheels, you go Sky Sports. You want two wheels, you go TNT Sports. And I like mm. that split. I do like it because it, it's it's very much, you want two wheels, it's TNT. You want four? It's Sky, and it's getting like that in America now, isn't it? Because you've got Roku getting more and more with the four wheels. You've got ESPN sort of dabbling, and then you've got all the NASCAR coming under sort of different banners. It's a bit more complicated in the states, but here in the UK, it's a bit two and two. Yeah, and then obviously everything else seems to be on YouTube now. Yeah. So uh, the oh, there's no motorsport on television anymore. Well, there is. And, and it's all streamed and it's all free, uh, a lot of it. So that argument is a bit null and void, but it's getting away from the point. Yeah, there is a one big, 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 big stopping block to this Liberty Media deal. And that is that Liberty Media is based in the United States. Now it owns both F1 and MotoGP, two of the biggest racing series on the international stage. It's a major change in the motorsport landmark. And it makes you wonder as well about the other major racing series in the world and what they'll do in response to Liberty's growing power. Two questions to you here, Matt. First, mm. would it be smart for other prominent racing series to merge and position themselves against a more powerful Liberty Media? And second, is Liberty Media going to get this through the EU because they now have a monopoly over F1 MotoGP, but also a major monopoly in motorcycles as they own MotoGP and World Superbikes. Now, when Dorna brought both, the EU didn't like it, introduced this law, so in the future, you can't own both. So there's now a possibility that Superbikes, as you said earlier could be sold on to another investor. So are they going to get it through the EU Court of Appeals? Interesting, yeah. I mean, when this story first kind of was doing the rounds, <coughs> excuse me, in the under in the underground of sort of Twitter and the social media landscape, you brought that up in the grid in our own grid chat. Like this is going to be a thing that's going to be potentially a problem for them. And um, if I've got this right now, I'm not a hundred percent sure. So I'm not going to go fully on the record with this. But when MotoGP and Dorna, they didn't buy World Superbike outright. They bought the mm. television rights, and that came with it in Italy. I got a right. slight feeling with a few years ago. Um, so they ended up with it in their lap, basically, and I went, oh, well, we'll give it a go. But you're right. But they may. They may have. They may want to in a few years' time, and they may have to. Um, they may be, you know, forced to put World Superbike out to not to pasture because that sounds like it's going to be killed off. But you know what I'm trying to say here? Just shuffle it off to again another thing. All there was it. What's the phrase? A uh, high tide raises all ships. Let's hope that there isn't going to be a couple of championships like World Superbike and 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 others coming together and going right. We need to we need to get on together here and um, keep ourselves going because that that just will end up in uh, a bad shape for everybody, I feel like. So let's hope it can. Clashes, as we've already talked about, hopefully will sort themselves out. And with um, a lot of the European television stuff, Sky in Italy uh, especially have F1 and they have MotoGP Both. on Sky. It's not the same in Spain, but it certainly is in Italy. So... Um, they want to avoid all that for televisual cl clashes and them being on at the same time. It's not so bad when they're in two different time zones at the same time as we saw a couple of weeks ago with Melbourne and Portugal worked out quite well. But um, when they're both in Europe, they don't want to be on at the same time. And um, we've seen that at Silverstone a few times, haven't we, where they've shuffled the order of the races around for MotoGP so that they didn't have a clash 
where Moto 2 ended up being last, or Moto 3 ended up being last. Mm. And everybody went home after the Grand Prix, the Moto GP race at Silverstone and didn't watch the last one because they'd seen the main race and, and they left. So going to be interesting. This It's not done, this thing. It is still going through, and it's probably going to take all the way probably to the end of the year, mm. people are suggesting, for this to get all signed off, all I's dotted and T's crossed. So um, obviously we'll keep you updated on the show uh, every week when we get some more news but i'm looking forward to kota for mm. two weeks time for motor gp because we're going to have everybody in the paddock for the first time since this news broke and we're going to get i'm sure more quotes and tidbits and potential things going forward so that's going to be interesting to one to keep an eye on in kota in a couple of weeks yeah i totally didn't message julia trusevich and maddie patterson asking which one of you are going to be in the comments box this weekend completely forgetting that it's next week, oh, not this week. Gone. yeah mm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've, I've, I've gone completely they, honestly they think i'm a lunatic now <laughs> you know there's a super bike my brain features a v8 supercar with two wheels it's quite like that to be fair the style of racing uh, that we saw <laughs> can't be at times yeah especially with top rack uh speed sports yeah. one here in the usa broadcasting the record supercars live uh oh yeah that's tnt as well aren't they, for, for supercars when they can be bothered here's <laughs> Something that uh, I've also thought about in this deal quickly before we move on. Now, we know we talked at length about the Andretti Formula One mm-hmm. thing. If Liberty can get BMW and Kawasaki into MotoGP, um, it's going to be the end of World Superbike potentially, but BMW will, now, now they've finally got it rolling, it seems, in World Superbike after many, many years of trying. If that Liberty went to them, you know, come across and, and build a build a prototype and go about a GP race, you know, they'll probably go, yeah, OK. Mm. Uh, they may open that up a bit more. So we may start to see down. This is I'm talking three or four years down the line here. Guys, next regulations, you know, isn't may, it? Yeah, exactly. Next thing, true, which is 26, I think, off the top of my head. Same um, as F1, yeah. Coincidentally. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we may end up seeing a couple more manufacturers into motor gp which isn't a bad thing either oh, there's more if, and there's plenty of money to go around because we, as we're hearing this is getting on towards five billion dollars so yeah. um there's plenty of money in the pot here for them to give to them here mr manufacturer come and race in my championship here's a pot of money to come and help you do so no more blocks either which is great for me because mm. it's all under one roof. Yes. So no more Dorna being, you know, sacrilege. So that's brilliant news. Might lose my monopoly because I get the good viewers, but we'll take it. Um, it opens more doors in the sports. Uh, final before we move on to the next story. Uh, I just want, because we're talking about TV deals. If you are in the motorsport world and have never seen the British Touring Car Championship, I implore you oh, yes. to take a look this year because on ITV Sport, on TikTok, you can see all 30 races live for free on TikTok around the world. No matter where you are, you can see it live. And I can't wait. Josh T was trackside for us today at uh, Brands Hatch. Cars look great. This infrastructure looks great. And it looks to be a good atmosphere. We did a show earlier on about it. So, Matt, that's great news, isn't it, for, for touring cars? It was a comp- – didn't see that one coming, to be <laughs> quite honest, uh, that we're going to have live touring cars on TikTok. If you're in the States – Let's hope you don't end up losing TikTok, but now you'll end up because, you know, that's a thing that's going on. We don't talk politics on this show often, but that's the thing that's going on. Adam says he'll be watching. Um, Yeah, get on to Touring Cars. Kicks off in a few weeks at Donington Park with the first round. So uh, that'll be a good one. If you haven't got a TikTok account, time to make a burner account for TikTok and uh, follow ITV on there and make sure you watch some British Touring Cars. Yeah, I'll be there in two weeks' uh, time as well on the season launch day for Donington Park. And I'll be back literally a couple of hours before this show. So I can probably get something together and we can show it from some footage of, from Donington there as well. Right, on to our second story. And ahead of last weekend's Tokyo e Prix, uh, Lola Cars announced its return to racing, forming a multi year technical partnership with Yamaha Motor Company. Now, together, Lola and Yamaha will enter Formula E in season 11. That's next season, the 2025 campaign. Uh, With over 500 race wins to its name, Lola will certainly hope to add to the list 
working together with Yamaha to develop and supply a successful Formula E powertrain. A familiar name, of course, to the Formula E paddock and to my own self in the commentary box, Mark Preston, has been named as the motorsport director to lead the new project. Hardly unsurprising as well, because he was the former Tachita team principal. And as soon as he left, he became head of Lola Cars. And then slowly he was teasing me about this at the start of 2023, that this was in the development and then it got announced as well, which is great. Uh, Mark Preston said that the Lola Yamaha partnership is the first of several major projects they have planned to re-establish the British company as an industry leader in sustainable engineering and motorsport, the graphic courtesy there of Formula E. Yeah, Matt, how exciting is it to see Lola return to professional racing with Yamaha? Now, Yamaha has been missing since 2005 in uh, four-wheel drive, of course. And, of course, they went that the 1997 season with Arrows and Damon Hill. Do you see them being able to find early success in Formula E? I mean, with Mark, a person that well, Mark's great. He was a team pitcher to Cheetah. He brought them up massively throughout the season. And he's a right laugh in the commentary box as well. Any excuse to use an old Murray Walker line, your heart goes out to Damon Hill. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Bridgestone tires, Arrows, Yamaha, uh, Hungary, 97. Um, great. Excellent. Well done, Till Betrosheimer and everybody at Lola Cars, because this has got Lola back on the world stage. They've been uh, trem- uh, not so far away from where I'm sat at Huntingdon, uh, the old base where they were kings of endurance racing for a very, very long time. Had that ill-fated run in Formula One with the MasterCard team, which went for two rounds <laughs> and then disappeared in... 96 seven whatever that was uh seven well done thank you um and then yeah uh, ended up going into administration a few years ago pre-pandemic but now they're back and uh it's a good to see them tie up with yamaha as you mentioned obviously much more known for their two-wheeled uh stuff and we've obviously talked a lot about gp on the show already and and the, the name valentino rossi in that but um they're back in four wheel racing and uh this was uh, good to see this get announced at the weekend. More on it to come uh, as we go through the year, ready for next season. Uh, Mr. Preston has uh, said that there's going to be more announcements at Magello in a couple of weeks, so keep an eye on that. Of course, Adam is correct. Lola was in IndyCar for a very, very long time, uh, uh, back in the champ car days. So that is um, really good to see them back on a full international scene. Ben says, glad to know our representatives are focused on what truly matters. I bang TikTok. Well, we, I try to keep some breast of what's going on in the world, Ben, outside of uh, outside of motorsport, and that's obviously something that may be coming downstream on your, your side of the big pond. Uh, but good to see that Lola are back, and with Yamaha, the car looks cool. If they run that livery, we'll certainly see it uh, on track uh, next season. There it is, with the bright yellow and blue. I'm sure it won't look exactly like that, but uh, if they can keep it in some sort of vein to that on screen then um yeah it will certainly stand out obviously all of the other things will will come to uh come into play over the next few months with drivers and teams lining that they'll tie up with and all that kind of thing so uh, um yeah really exciting to see the Lola lane back in international four-wheel motorsport I'll tell you what, I was just flicking through my contacts to make sure I did have Mark's number because I was going to say, oh, well, I'm going to try and get Mark on uh, to talk about this on the grid show at some point. And I was just was looking through and it's really weird. The, the contact names I've got, Mark Blundell in there too. <laughs> uh, Cadwell Park, Maddie Patterson, Mark Preston coming in there as well. It's it's mad sometimes who's in your phone. Uh, oh, Bernard Cribbins as well. Uh, if anybody, you know, uh, if you've watched Dr. Here, Wilfred Mark, if you know the Wombles, he was the voice of the Wombles as well. So, uh, yeah, and um, oh, we lost him a couple of years ago. That was uh, last year. That was sad. Good old Wilfred Mark and uh, Doctor Who. He played, of course, and Bernie Cribbins was a wonderful man. But yeah, just weird that I was searching through, just ch- checking out the number. Uh, I'll see what I can do if we can get him on to have a talk about this because having Lola back is an absolutely fantastic thing for motorsport as well. As we said, over 500 wins for them in motorsport over the years. Now, the supercars invasion continues in NASCAR as Dickford Racing's Cam Waters prepares for his debut this Friday night at Martinsville Super Speedway. Now, Waters will compete in the Craftsman Truck Series race, driving the number 66 Ford for Thor Sport Racing. The supercars isn't putting too much pressure on him uh, himself to perform since he's been... 
well, thrown out there into the bit of a deep end without any testing, but he hopes he can adapt and be competitive. In a media avail availability session yesterday, oh, don't get that out, uh, Waters said that it was his dream to switch from supercars to NASCAR full-time someday, the graphic courtesy there of Thor Sport Racing. I think he's been talking to a bit of SVG, hasn't he, as well, it seems like, over the past couple of months as well. But what do you expect from uh, Waters in his truck series debut? And is it surprising that his first NASCAR race is actually on a short track? Yeah, you would expect it to be on a road course, wouldn't you? A bit like we saw with, obviously, SVG at Chicago and then Brody Kostecki at Indianapolis last year. But Cam did visit this very race last year uh, as a guest of Monster, so he's been to Marsonville before because he was here there last spring. Um, good to see him come over. We'll have to wait and see how he goes. He's in good equipment at Four Sports, so he'll have a, a fast, uh, fast hot rod or hot truck underneath him at the weekend. It's, of course, the late race on Friday night, so uh, I have to keep an eye on see how he gets on. But, um, yeah, I mean, to, to this point, you know, we talked about this before. Again, something we've talked about on previous episodes supercars again probably going oh stop it why are you all leaving uh mclaughlin van gisbergen we know the kostecki thing is not really a, a leaving but he's not there waters now it's his dream to go to nascar and here he is they're going to end up with going to be it's going to be mostert versus uh, anton for the championship at this rate because everybody else is leaving so uh supercars continuing to um dig themselves into a bit of a hole in the driver market down there with all their superstar guys going to America. But good luck to Cam this weekend. We'll have to see how he gets on. Hopefully, uh, he won't have as much terrible luck or self-induced luck that he did at Albert Park a couple of weeks ago at the Grand Prix in the support. And I agree with Adam, Ten to 15, top 10 to 15 for Cam uh, this weekend would be, would be a good result for him. And then we'll see what he does from there. Is this going to be a one-off or is this going to be a bit of a, a program building through the year when of course we know supercars have only got 10 rounds left uh, between now and and the beginning of the end of november for the adelaide 500 so he's gonna have plenty of time to try and get back over and do some more races on some bigger ovals and maybe some road courses too although there is no more truck races on road courses of course as their only one of the year was at circuit of the americas a couple of weeks ago so it would be ovals from here on out for waters if he was to come over yeah, make more sense for him to come over and have a go with that as well. Maybe uh, is he maybe a bit too soon to throw him in uh, for Xfinity, but SVG did it. We'll see how it goes in the season because everyone apparently could just race with SVG and it, uh, uh, sorry in uh, Xfinity. It doesn't matter if you're a Cup Series driver or not. So, uh, oh, I'm looking very blotchy. I hope I'm okay. Uh, so let's continue on to our third story as uh, Richard Childress Racing's slow start to the 2024 season continues and a big change is being made to Austin Dillon's number three team. Uh, Keith Roden is out as Dillon's crew chief and familiar faces are returning to the top of the pit box as well. Justin Alexander is back as Dillon's crew chief. This will be his third different time leading Dillon's team. Meanwhile, Roden has been assigned to a different role at RCR. Now, according to Seth Sharp from NASCAR, Dylan's stats with Alexander are quite different compared to his experience working with other crew chiefs. In 166 races together, Dylan and Alexander have won four races, earning 14 top fives and 39 top tens. In 213 races with other crew chief, Dylan hasn't won a race with only eight top five finishes and 36 top tens. Now, after the first seven races of 2024, Dylan is currently 28th in the points and the photo courtesy there of RCR. Yeah, I've been saying it in the commentary box, Matt, you were with us as well in Kota when he was having a bit of an okay day, but... Will the crew chief change bring out the best in Austin Dillon, or do you think it'll be much of the same struggles he's experienced so far this season? It's been a very slow start for both Richard Children's Racing drivers this year, Austin Dillon and Kyle Busch. You go back to this time last year, Kyle had already won at uh, Auto Club, the final race at the big track there in Fontana, and then he went on to win a couple more races throughout the year. Dillon was kind of there or thereabouts to get into the playoffs, didn't quite make it. Uh, didn't, didn't quite make it in, and Kyle got to the round of eight from memory. But this start of this season, the speed's been there from the eight team, Kyle Bush, but he just ended up having a bit of bad luck from time to time, and then obviously got 
turfed off by Christopher Bell at Cota a couple of weeks ago while running in a good position. But Austin, every time he gets, if there's an incident this year, it wasn't Austin Dillon's fault. He's ended up in it somehow, some shape or form. Phoenix springs to mind when he got, uh, ended up being collected in the early shunt there, ruined his day. Um, but this is a, looks like on paper, as you mentioned, Josh, from the stats there, that this is a, a good change for that team. And we've got plenty of time to, you know, get him up the point standings. And, you know, it's not like it's this is two weeks before the end of the regular season and they're drastically scrambling to make a change to try and get him into the playoffs. So plenty of time through the summer for the free team to um, get things rolling and uh, we'll see what happens. Ben says, I, I hate to say it, but if you've gone through this many crew chief changes with one driver, your problem might be the driver rather than the crew chiefs. Yes, maybe, Ben, I, I get what you're saying, but he's in the uh, Austin Sindrick and Lance Stroll position where he's not likely to lose his job uh, in the next couple of weeks easy. So um, we'll have to see how this works out. As you said, Josh, the stats don't lie uh, and with uh, Alexander on top of the box. So we'll just have to see if he <laughs> if he ends up getting a top 10 at Martinsville this weekend, then instantly it will be uh, praised that this has worked. Absolutely. You can check out all of that action as well with our pre and post show coverage covering all of the motorsport for this weekend, including NASCAR. And of course, we revolve our show around NASCAR because it's the last one to run. And you can also catch the race live on USRN and on my own JB Motorsports as well. But now it's time to hand over to Matt for the latest from our gritty PI update. And I've been looking forward to this one, Matt, because it's a biggie. It is 2024. The European season is kicking off, and that means we can unveil the week one standings of the Grid Endurance Performance Index for 2024. And there it is on screen. And we have uh, a brand new leader has never led before the Grid EPI. Lawrence Van Four, winner of uh, the race at Bathurst, the 12 hour, and also the Qatar World Endurance Championship opener for Porsche. It is a Porsche fest there at the top of the championship with uh, Matt Campbell second and all other Porsche factory driver Michael Christensen in fourth place with Ferrari interloper James Gallardo there in third. Davide Regon was the early uh, leader from the first few races of the season, but we're now 10 races down out of 154 races that stand in our way to crown our third Grid Endurance Performance Index champion. Raffaele Marciello was the winner in 2022. And then last year, joint winners were Sebastian Bremi and Rio Hirakawa for Toyota, winning the World Endurance Championship and winning the Grid EPI. A couple of races at the weekend. They were on Easter Monday at Alton Park uh, for British GT, which got its season underway. The dad and son duo, Rob and Ricky Collard, winning the first race for Barwell uh, with their Lamborghini. And their teammates won the second one, Alex Martin and Sandy Mitchell getting the victory in race two. Plenty to come this weekend. It is a, suddenly, all of a sudden, we've got loads of races coming out of our ears. It's the first two races for the Nürburgring Langstrecker Series over the weekend on Saturday and on Sunday. The World Endurance, uh, World, GT World Challenge Europe, if I can get my words out, uh, Endurance Cup starts on Sunday at Paul Ricard. That's normally a six-hour race, but it is a three-hour race this season during the daytime rather than into the night that'll be an interesting one and the u.s version of gt world challenge gets underway at sonoma its traditional starter for the season there's the top 50 as it stands 10 races down of the 154 that make up the grid endurance performance index for 2024 those races i've just mentioned will give you the results as we always do on the show next wednesday and of course that means we get an updated point score and it's always exciting at this early portion of the season because everyone has to have at least three races under their belt to get on the leaderboard. And I, from memory, there's one person on seven, which is the highest starter so far this year of the 10 that we've had. So much more to come from the Grid Endurance Performance Index as we go throughout the year. And as I mentioned, it'll be those races uh, to bring you the updates on and an updated points score on the show next week now for something even more uh new and more launching uh back to kobe thanks matt and surprisingly we don't have any additional motorsports news stories from around the world so instead we're going to do something a little different before we get into hots and knots grid network is very excited to announce a brand new contest for our viewers and everyone 
here on the team to participate in. In the spirit of March Madness and the NCAA tournament that's been going on the last several weeks, here's the inaugural Grid Network Bracket Challenge. It's available to download. Link in the video description below. Be sure to fill out your bracket, and print it out, and share it with us on social media. 16 drivers from the 7 Grid Ranking Series will be paired up in this tournament beginning this weekend. Drivers and riders will earn points for wins, podiums, top threes, top tens, etc., Whoever has the most points will advance to the next round. Two drivers from each of the seven series were, were selected and two wild cards based on the projected grid rank. And that will come out this Sunday night on Grid Live Wrap Up. With that said, let's get started with the first matchup of the bracket challenge. We have the number one overall seed, Formula One's Max Verstappen, who's facing off against number 16 seed, Denny Hamlin from NASCAR. Verstappen will be competing at Suzuka this weekend, the winner of the last two Japanese Grand Prix races. He, he's a lot to win nearly every race unless there's a reliability issue like we saw in Australia. Ham, Hamlin's is going to be racing at Martinsville, a track he's won at a total of five times, but he hasn't won there since 2015, which is surprising. Almost been an entire decade there. He's also trying to keep his short track win rate at 100% after, after one at Bristol and Richmond. And if you want to count the LA Coliseum, that's another short track victory on Hamlin's resume. And now, now I'm going to bring everyone else back on here in the screen and i'm gonna start with you josh who do you see advancing out of the first round the top seed verstappen or does hamlin get it done with the upset considering how strong he's been on the short tracks this year i was gonna say hamlin took the victory last time out he likes having those records of being consistent he plays the long game and anything can happen so the the, the realism of me would probably go for him to have a better shot at martinsville to get through than verstappen at Suzuka and the reason I'm saying that is because the weather at the moment is so unpredictable for Suzuka we're actually not entirely 100% sure what weather we've got compared to one radar it's going to be dry and sunny compared to another radar we're going to have to be stopping and starting every five minutes because the track's going to be floating away so we've got no idea what is going to happen and with that this reliability of the Red Bull I don't think it's 100% fixed because at first they said, oh, it was, you know, the brakes over here because the tail got stuck in it. And then it was like, oh, because then when we reattached something in the garage, it wasn't working correctly. Now it's coming out, oh, well, it was an actual brake pad failure. Which is it? They don't know. So if that is happening again, because every time you go to the formation lab and it's, it's reheating the tires, it's going to be, you know, destroying them. And Suzuka is a very hard abrasive track. It's the hardest tire compounds of the year, the C1, the C2, and the C3. He's going to be starting predictably on the C2 tire, which in colder conditions really takes a lot to get into it on a warm-up lap. So he's going to be doing that on the warm-up lap, standing on the grid, brakes smoke like crazy at Suzuka uh, on the start grid, if it is a standing start. If it's dry, I don't, I don't see Verstappen going through. He's got too much of a chance. The Ferraris are really quick in uh, qualifying. They could go through. So compared to this, I'll say Hamlin goes through, not Verstappen. I'm going to have to agree with you, Josh, to be honest, because oh, no. I've got a funny feeling that McLaren are going to go really well at if it's dry. We saw how well they went there last year, uh, and nothing suggests that they won't go badly this coming weekend. So... And the way that Denny's been going on the short tracks, controversial slightly that it wasn't the weekend, um, mm -hmm. but he is going really well. And uh, yeah, question marks over whatever issue that Red Bull uh, had in Melbourne, still not potentially fixed. And if we get a load of wet running through the weekend, they may not have time to sort out whatever running they need to uh, confirm a fix with whatever they've fixed, if that makes sense. Uh, so yeah, Ferrari seems to be better than they have been mclaren will potentially be on the pace and then he's ripping it up on the short track so i would go with hamlin on that one as well I was surprised for that stat that he hasn't won for almost 10 years though at mines well that surprised me <laughs> matthew owen says is there a southeast there... west midwest region or indianapolis monaco bathurst and monza regions well that is something that we'll have to get and he also messaged me to say why haven't you got greg gumble hosting the bracket challenge kobe we need to get uh, greg on <laughs> and uh <laughs> get him in the grid network team yeah it would be nice to have someone like greg gumbel leading, leading this great bracket challenge that, <laughs> that, that we're starting up and and that was inter interesting that you guys chose hamlin with the upset over verstappen here well in my opinion i think it's going to be very close you know verstappen like i said a lot to win every single race and denny hamlin is you know hitting on all cylinders on short tracks right now so very well could see either driver pull it off and it'll be interesting to see 
who ends up getting getting this first round win. And and looking at versus teammate Sergio Perez, he's the second F1 driver in the bracket challenge, so he'll score points this weekend. His opponent is MotoGP's Jorge Martin, who will race the next time out at Circuit of the Americas. Checo's never won a Suzuka, and Martin is also winless at Coda. Matt, which competitor has the advantage entering their respective race, Perez or Martin? Well, you'd have to go Martin on this one, you would feel, because the Ducati is a fair, more more than likely so much better than everybody else. Although we saw last year in that race, a Banyaya fall off from the lead, which opened the door to Alex Rins to get a Honda to the checkered flag first, which was unthinkable last season, but it did happen. Um, so I would go with Jorge only because you you continue you look at Checo and even though he's been better these uh, first few races of this year he still should have been in the fight there with the Ferraris at Melbourne and, and a little bit wasn't so again he had issues with his car too during the race so I would go with uh, Jorge Martin to win that one I don't know because we're coming to a circuit where Mark Marquez is the king of Cota and he's now on a bike that he can race hard. And I think he's going to tow Alex with him as well inside the top two. And then I think that's going to shuffle up with Bastianini going up there, Bagnaia in third. Then you've got the KTMs coming in. And I, I'm still unsure about Martin. He's great at the sprints, but in the Grand Prix, he's going a bit up and down. I mean, he only just got Portugal sorted as well. That's because everyone else was busy fighting behind. But this is a very different track. Portugal is a roller coaster circuit. It's it's more like an aerodrome. You go up and down, up and down, up and down constantly. And it's really about having the right rhythm on the bike. So when you go up, because you're going to go over the hill, the front will come. You, if you're going forward, the, you know, the rear comes up. So you've got to put yourself back. And then it changes over the crescendo. So you go uphill, you're on the back. Then immediately you've got to throw yourself forward. So you're down low. Martin's very good at moving around like that quite quickly. And that's why he was getting it in and out of the corners quite nicely. But at Cota, it's a smooth riding style through the S's section, downhill into turn 11, down the long straight, holding that move tight, lifting off down through the back section as well, the long sweeping 16, 17, 18. And and Mar Marquez is very good at that. The Chikatis are very good at that. Martin isn't. He struggles here. So I've got this feeling that we're going to see him struggle. On the upside, I think Checo could do quite well because Perez does like this circuit. If you look back at it, he's always been challenging up there for the podium places. So this is based on how high they're going to finish up. I think Checo might just get on the podium. I think it's very possible Max could be second still. But I think Checo's going to be on that podium. And I don't think we're going to see Martin as high up as you as you think because we're going to have Mark up there with Alex, the KTMs, the Aprilias, throwing Bastianini and Bagnar and the other two Ducatis, and maybe an outside shot with Pedro Costa and the Gas Gas. It's a very top pack thing. And don't see Martin going through it. So I'll go Perez on this one. Can't wait to join you from OGP next weekend and just hopefully. Hopefully, Adam, yes, because we've got a couple of other people that might be joining in the comms box as well for the first time that I can't talk about. Josh leaving us with a little cliffhanger there, so I guess I'll say stay tuned to see who's going to be on uh, on your watch alone for Circuit of the Americas, and be sure to download the Grid Network Bracket Challenge. Print it out and share a photo of it with us on social media. You can use the hashtag Grid Bracket Challenge, the same thing you see at the bottom of your screen. The, the viewer who scores the most points will win a prize. You'll end up getting some of our Grid Network stickers. I'm going to display this on the screen. One, one, one final time to look to, to, to look at all, all of our different matchups. It's going to be very exciting to see how our Grid Network Bracket Challenge goes as we debut it for the very first time. And with that said, going to turn over to Matt for Hots and Knots. Thank you, Kobe. Uh, Easter weekend in the books then. And there wasn't a lot on a massive amount on. And that is going to kick on now, though, with the European season really beginning uh, this weekend with, as I mentioned, the GT World Challenge Europe getting underway at Paul Ricard, for instance. Hots and knots. Josh, have you got some hots for us from the weekend? Really enjoyed Tokyo. I think that, that was such a good race uh, in terms of, yes, it was a bit like a peloton, but it gave us some close racing. Great stuff from the Porsches. Da Costa, we were talking about just before he came in there, I think he did okay, but he's facing a chopping block. And I think, yeah, Tokyo went okay in my book. Um, 
didn't like how I was up and down or not like a yo-yo. Uh, still recovering. Look at the night shifts. I thought they were bad at the end of the year. They're worse now because they've, they've what they've done is they've condensed the calendar up, haven't they? So it's like you're doing six night races now and then you're doing like nine later on in the year. So it's like, let me sleep. Um, and I actually, I did enjoy the NASCAR. I thought that was quite uh, fun, a little race. Um, Matthew Owens, of course, joined me in the comedy box for stage three. Megan was with me for stage one and two technically one and a half because she was falling asleep at the second stage because she did a bit longer because uh, Matthew was busy, of course, with Thanksgiving dinner. Not Thanksgiving, Easter dinner, I should say. I'm getting ahead of myself there. Um, but <laughs> it was November. It was November, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, it was it was a good weekend. And um, I don't know. I have, I'm shocked. I think the only fault I've got is the overtime that happened with NASCAR. But we'll get on to that in a second. Good hots. I liked it all. What about you? Uh, I have... Two hots. Uh, I was away at the weekend, so I'm in a bit of uh, hurry up, catch up mode, so I could have something to talk about basically in this segment. One of them comes from Tokyo. Uh, Ollie Rowland, three podiums in a row. We did our little pre season show back at the beginning of the year, and we talked down on the Nissan, and all of a sudden, he's the fourth man. He could, he could, it probably should have won the race. Well done to Max Gunther, but three podiums in a row, suddenly he's in with a, sh- a chance of. Uh, being up there in the championship the way we know how random formula e can be if you can string some consistency together then uh you could be in with a shot so that's good to see and and uh, a good couple of weeks he's had and from rally safari at the weekend everybody had problems there was punches mm-hmm. there was rocks there was uh oik tanak on friday afternoon my pick and I won't be picking him again because that's two ra- rounds in a row I picked him and he's had a terrible weekend on Friday he hit a rock which put uh, pitched him into a bank yeah. and that was the end of the day broken suspension he came back on saturday on the first stage he had a bonnet that was half open had to stop and shut it in the after uh, also on friday morning he had two wheel drive for one stage because the diff had problems uh something else happened to him in the afternoon on saturday he just had every single thing that could go wrong at the weekend happened but through it all cali robin pera comes back after the disappointment of sweden and he did not put a foot wrong. Didn't have a puncher. Didn't make a mistake. He he was two minutes ahead of everybody at the end of Ooh. Saturday. He backed it down on Sunday morning and only won by only one by a minute and a half. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it, it just he's going to drop in and out of that car as we kind of talked about at the beginning of the season and win all the rallies he's going to be in. So uh, we're not entirely sure of his future schedule. It's Croatia next. Can't imagine he's going to be there. It's a tarmac rally. We'll probably see OJ back in the car. We'll wait to see. Um, and Adrian Formo in the Puma, another podium, two in a row. There was a lot of talk at the beginning of the season, at the end of last year, when Formo and Gregoire Munster were announced at the M Sport 14, that oh, they're going to have a really tough year with those two guys in the, in the car. But Formo was absolutely... He stood up and got a podium. And he also did a shake and bake, Ricky Bobby mentioned, <laughs> at the end of one of the stages over the weekend, when he got up onto the podium, which was cool. Sounds like a perfect weekend, isn't it, as well? Knots? Uh, two knots. Uh, one knot for me. Oh, I I didn't like this overtime because we. why did they throw it? it? It did not need to be thrown. It was a half half spin just for the white flag. It, it wasn't necessary, and it, it, it cost Truex the win. And then Truex getting angry at both Hamlin and Larson. And, you know, he's he's not even going to be punished for that as well compared to everything. You know, Bubba sneezes, they throw the book at him. And it's like, I, I don't like how it just ended like that. I, it was a, it was very much, we've been sat here for four hours. For me, it's 4 a.m. in the morning. I watched a great race and that was how it ended. Didn't like that. Uh, the second, I hate April the 1st. I hate it. The amount, the amount <laughs> Same. of bleeding information that we thought, oh, right, that's not true. Oh, it is true. Oh, is it? No, it's not. Mara Rengel, I'm looking at you. You know, saying, <laughs> yeah, saying, yeah, this is completely 100% true. I'm going rallying instead. I'm, I'm retiring from, uh, you know, um, on track action. I'm going rallying. Next day, it's not true. But he releases a full on press release, press conference, the lot. And it was a lie. I was like, for God's sake, don't waste our time. 
And uh, then we have this whole Moro GP drama as well. It's like you're running around saying, "Is it? Was it all a lie? Have they just done the biggest lie ever by saying it for the past three months?" Oh, it's true. Oh, okay. I just it drives me up the wall. And oh, also the amount of Facebook comments, uh, the Facebook post. I stayed off socials. It was good. I was glad mm. I didn't wake up until about eleven thirty because I was doing the NASCAR race. Because it drove me up the wall looking back on Facebook comments and all that. Like, it's just, ugh. hate April the 1st. It's not good. April the 1st is good if you're a two-year-old who can play a practical joke. It's not good if you're a 43-year-old who is saying this, this, and this, and that. No, don't like it. There you go. There's my rant. Yeah, if you want to have a social media cleanse, do it on April the 1st. I, I have to agree with you. It is everything you look at, you go, eh, oh. Uh, oh no, that's not really that. Oh yeah, it's the first of April. Uh, Matthew Owens says not NASCAR Cup Series on Easter Sunday, unnecessary in an already loaded calendar that includes racing on Mother's, Father's, Fourth of July, Memorial Day, and Labor Day weekend. Yes, we've tried it for the last few years now, haven't we, with Cup Series? And it was at Bristol last year with the dirt race, which didn't work anyway. And it was on Easter, which doesn't clearly doesn't work. Uh, so interesting to see what they do. Will Richmond lose one of its dates? That's also been mooted after the weekend. I have to wait and see what happens on that. Omi agrees with you and yeah. I <laughs> on April 1st. I, I have two knots also from the weekend. One of them, uh, Joey Gase <clears throat> throwing his bumper. Yes. Now, now, that side, here's my thought pattern on this. Last year at Atlanta, uh, was, I think it was Atlanta, wasn't it? Uh, Josh Williams did the, the debris and he got black flagged and he parked yeah. the car. And everyone went, oh, yeah, he's sticking it to the man. Well, no, he wasn't. And he comes back and he's got a great ride this year. Is this now going to be the way for people to get sponsorship and great rides is by being stupid? Uh, I know Gase was upset with what happened and he, he got knocked out of the race. But mm. don't throw bits of your car at people. Especially Look at the guy the carting. He got banned. Well, yeah, yes, a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. So, yeah, not good. Uh, we'll have to wait and see what happens in terms of... Uh, I haven't heard that there's been any punishment. Probably won't be. Um, my other knot is Formula E Tokyo, <clears throat> if I clear my throat. And I hate... And I always use the casual fan reference. But if you turn that race on on Saturday morning, UK time, and just stumbled across it, that could that race could have been anywhere in the world. You would not oh, yeah, have known yeah. that right. that was in Tokyo. There was no high shots of the city like we see often at Rome, uh, for instance. XL, we know that it's in London because you've got the inner out and you can see the Thames and the, and the Docklands like railway going down the side of the racetrack. Other places we've seen, like Paris, they used to always show the Eiffel Tower in the background. That was just in the car park. It could have been in Hull, that race, yeah. not Tokyo. Would have been better for me. Uh, well, yeah, you would have been local. Uh, yeah. It could have been anywhere. It, it just didn't look like... Tokyo uh to me and the the ski jump at turn two was oh, yeah. unnecessary as well the one at Rome used to be cool I used to like the jump at Rome uh, but that seemed to be unnecessary didn't break uh, your back so, and over. yeah hopefully they do oh thank you Benny it was fine five grand there you go on Joey Gates so yes good um hopefully they do something with that they've got a foothold now in tokyo that's been coming for ages they've been trying to get that race off the ground they've got it going now so hopefully over the next couple of years we see it grow what they should do is go full drip tokyo drift and have it mm. at night yeah i was thinking the same thing actually i was like why are we doing it in the day better for the european audience better time you can have neons everywhere mm. makes sense Although you I could think bring Jamie, uh... some people out with their uh, 3,000 horsepower electric batteries going around before the race doing skids. Yeah, it just works for me. Do you know, <laughs> Japan would really work as a night race in Formula One as well because the amount of technology they've got. Tokyo is two different cities. By day, it's a normal hustle and bustle. feels a bit like New York, doesn't it? By night, oh, it's, it's uh, what's that? Blade, Blade Runner. Runner. Blade Runner. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> Vegas play runner. Fantastic city. So what you're telling me here, Matt, is that the only way we can get better deals is if we throw things and walk off. Right, okay. Well, uh, yeah, Josh is... Josh's job now. <laughs> He's Hope not Joe's doing watching. 
He's trying to get himself a new contract. <laughs> yes! <laughs> more! More contract! More time! More shows! It's all mine! <laughs> no, but can I replace Crofty now? <laughs> That's yeah. Not that yeah. Well, I'm, I'm sure we'll have F1 to chat about in this segment next week, as we always do. There might even be some more Red Bull news happen over the weekend. You never know. Yeah. Did you see that interview this morning with Sebastian sure. Vettel? Yeah. Sebastian oh, yeah. Vettel's been doing the rounds in the UK this morning, uh, promoting an energy drink. And everyone keeps going to him, are you coming back, Sebastian? And he's going, no. Yes. I'm going to drive a Porsche at Le Mans. Everyone's you forgotten about that. that. Everyone's yeah. forgot. Absolutely everyone's forgotten about that in the, the week or so that it happened since it was an hour gone. But yes, he's, I, it was like, I ha just happened upon listening to talk sport this morning and they went oh we've got sebastian vettel coming up after the break and i went yeah what's he, what's he peddling why is he here and it was a, an energy drink he was on everything sky bbc talk sport everywhere yeah he's had a busy old day as uh the the, the, the former world champion mm. okay your data because the rumors i'm hearing is that that porsche <laughs> le mans is a bit of a shaking the muscles to come back for a full-time F1 seat for a year. Don't know where, though. Don't know where. And it's not going to be at Mercedes. Oh, no. I think he'll be back at Aston because Alonso's tipping over to Mercedes for a year. So don't get your hopes up because I know I would put it as Sebastian, but they seem to want Alonso. That's what I'm hearing. So we'll keep an eye out on that uh, throughout the season because I think the first bet was actually Max Verstappen. That's what Toto said. And interesting enough that Toto has skipped skipping the Japanese Grand Prix. He wasn't supposed to be here this weekend in Japan and he will be because of the poor start they've had. Or is it because oh. excellent con excellent time to talk with Max Verstappen and his Japanese sponsors. Just saying. Mm. And Sky aren't on the ground this weekend. They yeah. are in the UK studio. So, yay, I've had to call several extra people already. Uh, okay, let's uh, take a look. Are we done with Hots and Knots? Yeah, that's it. I think we're done. More Hots and Knots next week. Fantastic. So, taking a look at our upcoming schedule, and as I have to put my glasses on to read the script now in bits, uh, Saturday, Grid Live pre race as well. The Sunday, the Grid Live wrap up. That's 90 minutes after the NASCAR Cup Series race at Martinsville as well. Monday, Grid Live Encore recapping the trucks and Xfinity at Martinsville. There's also some talk at a possible extra show. The possible grid after dark, whether that's Japan or China, we don't know. Stay tuned to the Grid Network socials for that to see when we're going to have that uh, wonderful after dark show uh, that we did a couple of months ago when it was the last Japanese Grand Prix. Uh, further down as well, please do continue to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And we must thank you very much for helping us reach our goal of 1,000 subscribers. Now we're on the road to 2,000 subscribers. You can hit the bell icon to get notifications for when we go on the air. And you can follow all of our social media platforms and visit gridranking.com as well did you say after dark joe yes i did say after dark that's a possibility because we don't know yet if it's japan or china or both so yes possibility for after dark which is when the grid network team is a bit let loose and uh, we could talk about a pre-show for formula one because it's in the middle of the night and everybody's waking up so come and have some early morning breakfast with us all around the world you can also uh, take five minutes to invest in the grit network through patreon you can join colin mark Shell, robin david and matthew who help us uh, stay on the air each month by investing in the grid network and we encourage you to join these fine folk as they really do keep us on the air and once we hit 500 dollars per month we can start sending our team to the track to cover more races and continue expanding our coverage link to all of that is in the video description as well and if you want to do a one-time donation you can click on the buy me a coffee link get your name on the board and invest as much as you want and consider buying a specific on air personality a cup of coffee and they'll thank you on the air you can also support us by donating during our live streams through super chat as well so for kobe lambeth and matt white from the grid endurance performance index i'm joshua birch thank you very much for watching we'll see you next time enjoy japan as well it's going to be a classic Bye bye